let me tell you something about yourself. You may or may not believe it, but you are all very well connected. This is not flattery. You have friends, family, colleagues, classmates. You probably have a pile of business cards sitting on your desk gathering dust right now. Maybe you even participate in group activities, like sports or a book club. These groups of interconnected people all form networks. Some of these networks may require more technology to function, and then some of them may be more complex than others, but they're all networks. Networking has become a very popular buzzword. Frequently, we are trying to just constantly build the biggest network possible. And now, we are more interconnected than any other time in human history. But I believe this misses the big point. I think we should be building the most useful networks, and not simply the biggest. My name is Rami Sayar. I work in digital development, and I build tools for the mobile and web space. My work involves putting our networks to use through collaboration. Because I believe that together, we can build bigger and better things than we ever could alone. But the outcome is not guaranteed. Together, we can also build bigger messes than we ever could before. So, how can we be sure that the product of our collaboration looks more like the Grand Pyramids than a pile of rubble? That's the big question. You see, we want to keep the best parts of networks, their ability to generate a large number of ideas very quickly. But on the other hand, we also want to keep and weed out the chaos that could happen from networks collaborating. Now, you see, I believe in building collaborative systems that function like democratic societies, where everyone is treated equally and everyone can contribute. I also like to experiment. So what we're going to do is we're going to experiment with democratic collaboration right here today. So for this experiment, our first ingredient is a network. Now, I know that there's a cardinal rule for attending talks, and that is that you have to keep your cell phone turned off. I like to break the rules. So I'm going to ask you to all to take your cell phones out from wherever you've been hiding them, and because we're going to use them to do our experiment. So while you do that, I'm going to explain how our experiment is going to work. Today, we're going to build a network with the 300 people in this room. So now, this network is based on the fact that all of you came out this morning to participate, and thank you. And congratulations, you're now all part of the world's newest social network. <laughs> so, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at art. Now, most of you probably believe, and traditionally that's what we thought, is that art is really just the self-expression of an individual author. We always have images of Van Gogh or Beethoven silently working, dedicated to their craft, dedicating their entire life's time trying to master and create a beautiful art piece. I think this image is antiquated. I believe that anything can be done collaboratively. So, what does that mean? It also means that even art can be created together by strangers working, trying to achieve the same goal. So for our little experiment, what are we going to do? We're going to write a story collaboratively. Now, behind me on the screen, you see a desk and a paper. But we're not going to see a pencil here. The pencil is actually in your hand. We're going to use our cell phones to submit sentences to our virtual paper. So the way that's going to work, and before you start sending your sentences, I just need to let you know the sentences have to be in English. They can't contain any profanities. It's very important. After all, this is being recorded. And they've got to be more than just a few words long. OK? So as all good stories start, ours is going to start like this. Once upon a time, let's see what you send in. Interesting. All right. Maybe one more. Stuck in a room. 
all the speakers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so let's take a, a look at the story that we just made. This is how it goes. Once upon a time, I was a little girl, and I was dreaming of becoming an Olympic champion. I loved chocolate, ice cream with sprinkles. I used to go for brunch on Saturday morning. Hearts were bursting with knowledge. I find myself stuck in a room. Hearts were bursting with knowledge. Oh, can't read. A dog walked into a bar and put on a fairy costume. All the speakers are really good today. I don't, I'm not quite sure how that fits in. A little mouse was feeling lonely. Imagination revealed its true potential. Damn, that, that mouse did pretty well. I saw a kid with a chicken hat, but there was no more chocolate cake. That, that makes me sad. So as you can see, our story probably won't win any Pulitzers anytime soon, and we probably won't embark on like a 300-person book tour. You see, it lacks sentence structure, quite clearly. There's also a big piece that's missing, a plot. Now, collaboration doesn't guarantee a useful outcome. 300 people working together can just create a very big mess. That's what we did right here. However, it's not the fault of any individual member of our network. It's perhaps, I mean, you can't be expected to read the mind of your peers to be able to come up with a cohesive story just like this. In fact, if there's anybody to blame, it's the designer of the collaborative network, and that's me. So, how do we fix this? Well, we're going to do this experiment a second time, except this time we're going to implement the principle of collaboration with constraints. What we're going to do is we're going to run this experiment a second time, except this time, when you send a message in, it won't be posted right away. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to buffer all the messages that come in within a 15 to 20 second time span, and we're going to select one at random. And we're going to build our story iteratively every 15 second time span. So once again, our story will begin with Once Upon a Time. I met a bunny named Thumper in the meadow. Send in new messages to add on to that story. This was the most amazing morning of the year. All right, bunny in morning, okay. I go out and run without knowing for how long. All right. So, once upon a time, I met a bunny named Thumper in the meadow. This was the most amazing morning of the year. I go out and run without knowing for how long. As you can see, we probably won't win any awards for this one either, but that's all right. What just happened is the result of an unstructured and chaotic collaborative network, but that's okay. But even now, you can see that with the constraints that we had, you had a bigger opportunity to actually create a more cohesive story. With this constraint and with the story that we just wrote together, they illustrate the basic point. Democratic collaboration with constraints allows us to, and then it happened and a spider was on my head. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> Democratic collaboration with constraints empowers networks to create things together. So now, I could have added more constraints, perhaps added you know, uh, something to check for context to make sure the sentences that were being selected were matching the story beforehand. But it still, nonetheless, illustrates the basic point. Now, not all constraints are created equal. Let me tell you the story of a Wikipedia user called SJ. He was an editor on Wikipedia, and he claimed to be a professor working at a California University. The problem was that 
He was actually really a 24-year-old dropout, and by the time that his deception was uncovered, he had already edited 20,000 articles. Quite impressive for a 24-year-old dropout, I must admit. So, Wikipedia recognized that he needed constraints. Otherwise, the stories or their articles on the encyclopedia would look sort of like our story, our first one. Qu quite a big mess. Now, the way that Wikipedia decided to implement these constraints is by having editors, editors like SJ. They would decide among who and which content should and shouldn't be published. Editors like SJ are what I would call a privileged user in the network. Now, let me say something. Us as humans, we aren't particularly very good at picking winners. We aren't really good at knowing if SJ was really a professor, and we aren't very good at knowing the difference between liars and the honest people, especially not on the internet. That's just impossible. So the idea of having a privileged user on a network, it reveals a deeper flaw with how we design our collaborative projects. Sure, it works. But I think, especially when it comes to art, we should be designing our collaborative networks differently to build art together. So let me talk a little bit more about this privileged user concept. See, the problem with privileged users is that they discourage the rest of the network from contributing. If I had told you that only the messages sent from the first row will be considered in our project, quite reasonably, the rest of the rows would probably not have participated. I mean, there's no reason to your message will never be selected. And not only that, if this privileged set of users, you just happen to be in the front row, thank you, um, decided to just leave, don't, don't leave, but, the, it, would just, it would prevent the rest of the network from actually finishing a project, because everything had to go through those privileged users. See, the problem is that now, we have this story that we're building together, but if our privileged user base disappeared, well then, the story would just abruptly halt and there'd be no artful conclusion. So then, how can we build networks that are able to collaborate democratically with constraints? We've seen that constraints are good in some cases and they can also have adverse effects. Now, the way that I see it is that to implement democratic collaboration with constraints, there's a couple of strategies that we could use. And we have to really rely on the wisdom of the crowd, wisdom of the network, to be able to identify which pieces are the best. So how can we collaborate together? So here are four strategies. The first one you've already heard. The first one is using randomness as a constraint. Now, randomness works perfectly fine if we can assume that all the contributions from our network are of equal merit. In other words, there's no real difference between what one member sent and versus another. To give you an example, we could use our collaborative numbers, so our, our virtual desk, to paint together, where every single person could send a, a little message that says, I want the color blue to show up. That's fine. It would work perfectly then. The problem is that with collaboration and randomness, some members of the group, it, it might not work so well because they might not be able to send in something that is just as good as everybody else. If there is the possibility that perhaps each member's message will simply not just be equal, then we could use another strategy. And the second strategy that I have in mind is voting. We let the wisdom of the network decide which outcome is the best. And crucially, you had no reason to believe that you were being treated unfairly. By voting, you were able to participate, you were able to contribute, but simply the outcomes that were the best for this project will be selected, will be voted up. Now, another strategy is something that I find is really, really important. When we have a large network of, say, the 300 people in this room, as you can see from our story, some members wanted to take the story in one direction and another wanted to take them the other way. There's nothing wrong with that. I like that. That's, that's really great. It doesn't make for a cohesive story, but that's awesome. What we could have done with our collaborative network right here 
is we could have inspired ourselves from nature. We could have used trees, to be precise. What does that mean? So when we have our collaborative project, we can build from a root, and then we could branch off depending on who is interested in going in one direction and who isn't. And we can let the network as a whole decide which branch is better. Now the three strategies I just outlined can be mixed and matched. We can put them together. So to give you an example, in our story, we could have allowed you to branch off and create your own story from a specific set of sentences at any point in time. And then within each branch, you could have used a voting strategy or a random selection to continue going on with that branch. Or you can even branch again some more. Collaboration with constraints, although it might sound unintuitive, it's actually really powerful. What we should be doing and what really allows us to actually build collaborative projects, particularly in the space of art, is to really think about the constraints that we want to use. Think about how we're going to balance the restrictions that we might have with the constraints that we want to use. So if we remember, creative output comes in most times in response to constraints. We should be harnessing that creative potential. We should leverage it. So in essence, collaboration with constraints is really about taking the output from a huge number of people, putting it together in a way that makes an efficient collaboration. To be able to do this would allow us to create more, to create better, to create equally, and finally, to really create together. Thank you.